Um, some announcements uh, for exercise three, uh, uh, well done yesterday for submitting all the work. Um, the recap session will be uh, next Monday. Uh, so today there will be another session. I'm not sure if there's going to be a session today um, because you've done all the work, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I guess there's no. Yeah, so he's here, so if you have any questions, uh, you can also ask him. Um, but otherwise, there's a recap session next Monday. Um, the grading, um, unfortunately, cannot be done this week because uh, there's ICML deadline um, this Friday, so we're all very busy with that. So um, we'll get this done after the recap session next Monday. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll be able to answer them. Uh, but you'll get the results for the exercises afterwards. Okay. Um, exam, a reminder to register again. Um, and exam instructions. So I'll give you some, um, um, some guidelines on exams uh, today in the lecture. I hope that helps. So um, what I'm going to talk about today um, exam, exam format, and some example exam questions, and also example answers uh, to the questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, evaluation and benchmarking in machine learning. Um, and then I'm going to talk about research at um, Scalable Trustworthy AI Group. Um, so there's no examinable material today, actually, just talking about uh, future outlooks and, um, and the exam. So some of the format and grading policy. So the objective of the, of the exam is identical to the objective of the course itself. Um, you should be able to critically read, assess, and discuss the current work. Um, and you should also show your technical ability to implement some of the solutions that we discussed. Um, and you should be ready to conduct research by yourself, ideally by the end of the lecture. And that has been kind of um, seen in the um, exam as well. Uh, we went over this in the first lecture, but uh, let's go over it quickly again. So after passing the, uh, after submitting all the exercises one through three, uh, you're going to get the grades, right? And the average grade should be greater than 60% to be admitted to the exam. And you take the exam and you're going to get exam score. And uh, together with the pop-up from the exercises, you're going to get a final score. And that is mapped to the final grade. Okay, so the exam score will be based on those nine questions, um, six basic questions and three advanced questions um, in the exam. In total, you'll, you'll be given 90 minutes. And during this 90 minutes, you should get max um, 180 points. And those 180 points will be mapped to 0 to 100 range linearly. Um, sufficient condition for a pass for now is 50%. Um, but of course, after, um, after all the grading is done, we'll decide again uh, whether that should be lowered uh, to be less uh, restrictive, right? And then there is going to be final score, which is accounting for the exercise top-up from your exercises. The max top-up is 10% point on top of the exam score. Um, if it goes beyond... 100% after summing these two up, then we're going to cut off at 100%. So you cannot never get uh, something beyond 100%. And finally, the final grade uh, between 1.0 and 5.0, um, the exact mapping will be decided uh, post or after the uh, grading because we, we don't know yet um, what, what's the uh, difficulty of the exam. I mean, precisely. We try to uh, kind of control that as much as possible a priori, but uh, there is always um, some uh, further calibration afterwards. Um, as you know, uh, there's this green mark on top of the slides that are examinable. Okay, a little bit more about the format. So you're going to have 90 minutes. We're going to cover three topics, OD generalization, explainability, and uncertainty quantification. For each topic, you'll have two basic questions and one advanced question. 
Those two basic questions will require seven and a half minutes uh, to solve, and you'll be awarded 15 points for um, complete answer. For the advanced question, you'll be uh, the uh, advisors to use 15 minutes for that, and you'll be awarded 30 points for complete answer. Um, well, in general, uh, we try to assign more points towards the complete solution than partial solutions. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is not exact graph that we are going to follow, but um, in general, um, so the x-axis is the, uh, the degree of completion of your answer, and y is the, uh, the percentage that you're going to get out of the max score. And it's always good to try to get the, the last bits of the, of the question to get the, the best pos possible results here. So yeah, that's sort of the uh, philosophy behind the grading for this course. So, and there's been some changes from last year. Um, last year, we had also the same number of questions for every topic, but the advanced questions are, uh, were harder, more difficult, and took more time. And the advice was to choose only one of the advanced questions. So you basically specialize in one of the topics that we talked about in the lecture. Uh, but then that was uh, a little too hard um, anyways, because uh, the scoring is, in a sense, also relative, and people were pressured too much to still try um, all three uh, advanced questions, and of course, uh, they were running out of time to do that. Um, so to reduce the stress during the exam, we decided that we we're gonna make every question uh, less difficult, um, even including the basic questions, and also less time-consuming, while recommending people to try out all the questions. So you're still recommended to um, attempt all the questions, um, but uh, we'll make sure that this is uh, doable within the time limit. Um, so last year, the recommendation was to spend 30 minutes per advanced question, but now we're gonna reduce the, half the content, basically. Okay, so let's go through some of the um, example questions. Let me see. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to show you. Uh, maybe um, I need to count, but I think uh, I'm going to talk like go through a full exam um, by doing this. So the first question here is uh, a basic question, 15 points. Explain the following concepts: uh, task, development, resources, deployment, environment, and then uh, describe one machine learning setting. Um, other than in distribution generalization, because that's super um, simple. Um, and you have to explain the task, development resources, and deployment environment in that case. And I'm, I'm gonna show the example answer from ChatGPT. It did a decent job, actually. Um, explains, uh, well, this is actually from 2023, last year, and this is from this year. Maybe let's go through um, the answer this year, which is uh, apparently better than last year. Task, uh, machine learning system. Task is uh, what the model should learn and achieve, blah, blah. Um, development resources, there are tools and assets needed to build a machine learning model. So they seem all right. Um, now deployment environment is a little bit off because it says uh, this is where the machine learning model operates after deployment. Um, it's real world setting or system where the model is applied. This can vary from servers to applications and the embedded system in devices. I mean, in general, this is a correct, great answer actually, um, but from the context, in the context of our lecture, when we talk about deployments, uh, we care a lot about the distribution shift, right? So there's, there should be some um, extra discussion about the, um, the shift in distribution, the types of inputs they get. Um, but that kind of um, discussion is missing here. Um, and they came up with a good example here, transfer learning. Task and de development uh, are explained perfectly, but deployment, again, is uh, talking more about the devices like smartphones or chatbot on a website. Um, doesn't really talk about um, how the training data and the deployment data uh, could look differently. So based, based on this, I would give um, five out of five for task, five out of five for development resources, but only two out of five for development deployment environment. And totally, it's gonna be 12. Um, 
you still did a great job because uh, when you talk about deployment, it also involves all the resources surrounding it. And uh, of course, uh, it's not wrong, but um, it's not really um, touching upon the, the, the core of the lecture, right? So, okay. Let's move on to the next question. So this is now explainability question. Uh, what is a counterfactual explanation? Describe the input gradient explanation for attributing a test prediction to individual pixels. Based on your answers, argue that the input gradient explanation is a version of counterfactual explanation. What are the limitations? So you, you basically have to answer each of the question here. Okay? Um, you kind of see the scoring gra grading scheme here. So for every question, you're going to have roughly the uh, one end of the grades assigned for the whole question, right? Um, and then it explains, uh, gives an answer to each question correctly. So counterfactual explanation shows how the slight change in input could lead to a different prediction. It's like saying if this input were a bit different, the outcome would change. So that sounds good. Um, Integrating explanation looks at how changing each, each pixel affects the prediction. Yeah, so that's a uh, that's nice extension of the previous yeah, definition of counterfactual explanation to input gradient. And then it explains again uh, how input gradient explanation is a good instantiation of um, um, counterfactual explanation by applying the definition here to the, to the question, right? So that's great. And it talks about the limitations like um, who cares about these small changes, right? That's the first um, item. Also, in complex models, uh, just looking at the input changes will not capture the uh, deeper reasoning of the model. Um, doesn't always match human intuition. Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit uh, questionable, though, because, you know, um, maybe uh, the explanation does not match human intuition, and that's probably a good thing, because that kind of shows how the model behaves differently, differently from humans. So the explanation is still faithfully showing what the model is doing. And we don't penalize the um, explanation itself for predicting something that is against the human intuition. So in that sense, I could um, also deduct a few points from this one here. But, um, but since all the other points are good, um, I don't necessarily deduct points from this. Um, depends on the model smoothness. It works best if the input changes will lead to small output changes. If the model is way too um, fluctuating too much, then uh, probably um, yeah, the input gradient is not as good. So overall, this is good. Please also um, take note um, the length here of the answer. Last year, a lot of people um, generated a very, very short answers to the questions, and we were unable to give full grades for doing that. So. Um, I would say this is something like this, or the previous answer here, is, uh, seems to be a good ballpark for the, the right length of answer for the, the basic question. So uh, please also aim to elaborate further on your point, um, like, like GPT-4 is doing here. Next question, um, again, explainability. Explain the soundness as a criterion for the quality of feature attribution method. For natural images and arbitrary neural network, it is generally possible to obtain the ground truth attributions. Explain with an example how one may construct a pair of an image and the corresponding ground truth pixel attributes. Hint, through image synthesis. What is the limitation of such an evaluation? Okay. Example answer. Soundness is in feature attribution means the methods results are logically and consistently reliable. For good attribution method, it says a feature is important, then feature should truly influence the model decision. So the essence is kind of there, so I deem um, this is a correct answer. Um, getting ground truth attribution for natural language, natural images, and arbitrary neural network is tough. I don't know exactly how, which features the neural network uses to make decisions. Here's an example of constructing an image and its ground truth attributions. Um, you make a synthetic image uh, with a simple shape on a sh plain background, um, train a neural network to recognize the shape. The ground tr truth attribution is clear. The pixels uh, forming the shape are important. Others are not. Okay, so that sounds all right. 
um, you basically have a plain background and then you just have simple shapes and um, if the attribution is pointing to the shape then it's right okay so that sounds uh, not super ideal but still okay -ish. so I would still give a full score for this answer okay and it talks about limitation yeah for the interest of time I'll just skip it um, if you're interested you can always come back to the slide and see what 54 says. Okay, so this is an um, uncertainty um, quantification bit. Um, so we have basically a log scoring rule for, um, for multi-class classification task. And then um, you have to state first what is a, a proper scoring rule. And you have to prove that this log scoring rule is a proper scoring rule. No, uh, I think this was one of the um, um, questions that were that was uh, left as an exercise during the lecture. But actually, I'm going to give you a, a full proof here <laughs> for for this uh, answer. Um, this is not a good answer, by the way. Um, it talks about so the definition of uh, scoring rule and proper scoring rule is good here. Um, cross entropy loss, um, right, and then. It computes the expected value of this uh, log likelihood, sorry, cross entropy loss. And then says, yeah, if you wish to minimize this, you can use uh, Lagrangian multiplier and uh, make sure that the gradient um, uh, is zero uh, when, the, when, the, um, when the distributions match. Okay. But actually, I'm not happy with this answer fully because. Um, the gradient equals to zero is only a, a necessary condition for maximality or uh, minimality. Maximality of the proper scoring and minimality of the loss, right? You also have to state that the function is either concave or convex um, to complete the proof that at the stationary, stationary point, the desired maxima or minima is attained, right? So I'm deducting two points for not talking about that. Um, so this approach is valid. You can take a look at the gradient and make the gradient equals to zero. But if you do that, you also have to state something about the um, curvature or concavity of the, of the loss function. Um, this is another approach. Uh, when I um, asked GPT-4 again, it came up with a good um, answer based on um, <clears throat> Jensen's inequality. Um, you can take a look. Um, so you first um, get the expected value of the cross entropy loss uh, for the prediction f and the ground truth p. And uh, you can show that you can use the Jensen's inequality to say um, you can swap the expectation outside of the function itself. So here's log here, right? And you can bring in the expectation inside the logarithm, right? And establish this uh, inequality here. And if you do that, um, so this part is the log likely, expected log likelihood, right? So this is bounded from below by um, the log of expectation over the, uh, the prediction. But now, um, this expectation of the uh, prediction is essentially py, right? And so um, you can bound this quantity, this loss here, from below by log of py. And so, um, and then you can now show that if fy was exactly py, then you're attaining this minimum here. And therefore, um, this quantity here is minimal if and only if um, fy is equal to py. Is that so the um, argument here is essentially saying that and that I think is a is a perfect solution so if you use Jensen's inequality um, you don't have to worry about well you still have to worry about the convexity but uh, maybe uh, this gives a simpler solution yes where does what come from Sorry, I didn't get your question. Can you say that again, please? 
but it's the only if it comes from it because what's clear to the long course just show that it is a minimum proof for A, whereas it is a proof that Frankfurt can capitalize as I remember what Frankfurt Right. You need uh, if and only if, right? Um, <clears throat> So, um, okay, so yeah, maybe you still have to make an argument that if Fy is not Py, then, um, then you're not obtaining that value there, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry? You have an idea? Okay. So, can this inequality be the only inequality allowing the equations to come to be linearized? And it is only linear if that argument becomes constant because otherwise you are dealing with finite sources and it doesn't become linear. And when it's constant, that precisely. Mm -hmm. um, do we need uh, strict convexity at some point, maybe? Um, not really. I not mean, really. Okay. it's implied by Jensen's inequality mm -hmm. that the application is uh, linear, but uh, for that you need this argument to be linear, and if it is a log-based thing, it will only be satisfied if it's constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah, I'm not too sure yet uh, because you know um, a linear function is also a convex function um, in principle. So um, if phi here is uh, linear, then um, this holds for any. You know, if log was let's say uh, linear here, then you don't actually care which value f y takes um, to attain the, the minimum here, right? So, um, so we need some argument around strict convexity. Yeah. Okay, I, I need to uh, think a little bit more about this. Um, this doesn't uh, come up on top of my head yet. Yes. We're we're maximizing the expected uh, score function, okay. right? Well, that's part of the definition of the, um, the properness of the score function. So <clears throat> we need to first take the expectation like this here, and then try to um, maximize it. Well, in this case, minimize it. Yeah, it depends on how you define the scoring function. Okay. In yeah. In our lecture, we define the score function as uh, something to be maximized, right? But um, if you turn this into a loss, you put a minus on top of it, so um, you're now minimizing the loss value. Um, can you say that again? Which part? Here. We define it as a maximization problem in the lecture, um, but I mean, I wouldn't deduct a point if you just say um, it's a minimization problem because it's only a, a minus away, right? If you just put minus everywhere and still. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay, so um, I'll probably follow up on this uh, after the lecture. Um, now let's go to the next question um, Bayesian model averaging. Um, how does BMA help us 
help us estimate the epistemic uncertainty. So the first question is, uh, what is BMA? And then you have to describe how BMA helps with epistemic uncertainty estimation. Um, and then um, you have to write a pseudocode in Python. Um, and then um, it says epistemic uncertainty. So the first question is epistemic uncertainty. No, um, the fir first question was, was BMA actually. Um, Okay, but still gives an answer about epistemic uncertainty, um, which is not required, but okay. Um, BMA considers a range of models weighted by their posterior probability it averages over these models. This helps in accounting for uncertainty in model parameters. Yeah, seems all right. Or, although um, I would actually deduct a few points for that because uh, it's not uh, technical enough. Um, you have to talk about the posterior um, distribution as well as um, how you eventually compute the BMA for a classification case, for example, um, that you're averaging over the, um, the predictions. Um, but this part is kind of missing in the answer. Um, and then it says uh, BMA helps estimating um, epistemic uncertainty by averaging predictions from different models. Each model represents a different set of parameters. The averaging reflects uncertainty model choice. So what is important here is to um, describe where the averaging is happening. You can also do the average in the parameter space or do the average in the, in the output space. Um, it's important to say that you're doing the averaging in the, in the output space, um, not just over the uh, parameters. So um, this is missing, so I'll deduct a few points for that actually. Um, yeah, this is uh, copied and pasted in a wrong way. And then um, the model um, came up with a, 54 came up with a pseudocode for doing that. So I'll um, try to show what it says. Yeah, so, yeah, this is basically the answer from the model and gives you a pseudocode for that in Torch. I mean, you don't have to import all these uh, libraries. We are gonna, not gonna run the code, um, but uh, it's interesting that the model, the, the GPT-4 knows how to generate the Bayesian linear model here. Um, so the weights are now initialized as a, as a parameter, yeah, with normal distribution, which is fine, and now, oh, In the fourth pass, you're doing um, mu plus the x of the uh, log of the variance, right? So now this is a positive value. So the trick here is to use x. Um, I said in the lecture you can use a soft plus for that, but x, x is also fine. Um, and then you're multiplying that with this uh, random normal distribution which is good, uh, it allows you to do reparameterization trick here. And then you're computing the linear layer on top of this, using this weight vector. And uh, now your neural network is uh, based on, based on um, two linear layers with one ReLU in the middle, okay? And then, yeah, you have um, definition of your model here and then you're doing, um, um, computing the output here, okay? But if you remember uh, what you're asking for, uh, for the forward pass, right? So we don't actually need all these um, definitions of the parameters um, and so on, we just need a forward pass. Uh, <clears throat> and also, um, you have to do a, um, model averaging, right? So that's the gist of the question here. So instead of just um, computing one instance of the, sorry, I need to check again uh, how many samples you're getting here. Yeah, so you're just getting a single sample here. So you're not doing any model averaging here. So on top of the outputs here, you need to um, do it several times to, um, to get multiple instances of the outputs and average through um, these outputs. So 
Um, the answer is not super good. I was uh, tricked into saying, yeah, it's 15, but uh, you know, GPT-4 is super good at that. So um, you have to be careful and um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's going to be uh, good to define today um, what is the exact boundary between um, an okayish code and too much code and not so good code, right? Um, so. I would say uh, the answer, sorry. The answer here is uh, way too much, uh, first of all, because it's doing something that you didn't ask for and also it's doing a very precise definition of every function and so on. And you're not gonna um, have to remember all these details. Uh, what we need is, um, for example, a class definition here and, um, and definition of the forward pass, like def forward, um, and then you sample the weight here, and then you somehow say um, you're using this way to compute the linear forward, okay? Um, so you don't even have to remember um, if this f.linear is uh, taking input first or weight first or whatsoever, you just say, well, here you're going to compute the, the output of the linear layer, which is combining the weight from here and input from there, right? You just say that. Um, but if you make it too coarse and say, um, uh, well, we're going to sample the weight from a random distribution uh, where you don't actually specify which random distribution, for example, or if you don't do any reparameterization trick here, and just say, yeah, we sample the, the forward pass several times and average them, um, that's a little to less. You have to say, um, you're doing how many samples? You define the variable um, t, for example, for indicating how many samples you're getting. Um, and then um, you have to kind of indicate which dimensionality um, the outputs will have and along which dimension you're doing the averaging as well. Um, so for every line, you have to de describe what is exactly being computed, what are the tensors and what are the shapes of tensors that you're handling here. Um, but you don't have to be um, correct in terms of the name of the function and the ordering of the arguments um, that is not needed. Um, but you have to clearly describe what each line um, is encoding. Any further uh, clarification do you need? Um, yeah, okay. All right. So um, let's move on to the next question. Um, some advanced question now. I'm going to show you uh, three examples. So first one is um, OD generalization. So let this be the output of an in image classifier um, so these are probabili probability vectors, so all of these are non-negative and they all sum to one across uh, the class dimension. Um, now you have projected gradient descent objective where your goal is to maximize the loss value for the sample x by um, introducing some additive perturbation um, whose size is smaller than epsilon in terms of um, L2 distance, L2 norm. And now um, the default objective is essentially um, kind of the, the dual. So you're trying to minimize the norm while satisfying the condition that your label after doing the normalization. Okay, so, so the, the label after normalization sorry, the prediction of the ground truth y for after, after doing the perturbation is uh, smaller than um, the other classes. 
So C here is something that is not Y. I should have uh, written actually C not equal to Y here. And um, the other prediction should be uh, have higher probability prediction than the ground truth prediction. So in other words, uh, your answer has to be um, different after applying this uh, uh, perturbation, but the perturbation size is, uh, has to be minimized. Okay, uh, that was a very long and uh, um, long way to say that, long-winded. Um, now describing words what this objective is trying to do. Okay, and now um, you have some continuation of that. So here again, you have to write a pseudocode for optimization of this objective using the gradients. Um, so I'm giving you further hint here that you can use the gradients like this one here um, to achieve that. And I tell you that there's no need to give us any uh, convergence guarantee or optimality. Just need to come up with a suitable solution here and uh, some verbal justification for that, okay? So there were two parts. So the first part was to describe what uh, this deep full objective is doing. And it says uh, it's a method that seeks to find the minimal perturbation that can change an input's uh, input image classifier's decision. It minimizes the size of the perturbation vector delta under the constraint that this perturbation is sufficient to mislead the classifier. Um, in simpler terms, DeepWolf tries to alter an image slightly so that the classifier incorrectly labels it while changing the image as little as possible. Um, the description applies to any attack. Okay, so <laughs> again, I made a mistake here. I think this is good. I thought uh, this was um, very general, but um, yeah. Um, I would actually give you give this uh, answer much more score than um, than I did here. Um, yeah, I, I was rushing a bit with the with the answers and uh, yeah, um, but this is good, and um, never mind the the score here. So we'll have more time for the for the actual grading. So this will not happen. <laughs> yeah, um, but still, I have some complaints about the. Um, about the pseudocode that, uh, that's generated here. Um, yeah, blah, blah. Uh, what is important is this bit here. So initialize with this delta, um, while the image x plus delta is classified, classified as the truth class y. So that sounds uh, a good um, condition here to put. And then you do iterations here. Um, calculate the gradient. Um, of Fy minus max of Fc uh, for C not equal to Y. Um, so that's good. Update delta by a small step in the direction of the negative gradient. Um, so here I would deduct a few points here for not uh, writing this down as an equation uh, where you specify what you mean by update and what you mean by a small step. Uh, so what you can do here is to define a new variable lambda or something as a kind of step size um, indicating how, how much you're actually moving and um, you write down uh, the update equation for delta okay instead of just saying update um, you have to specify whether that's a multiplicative update or multiplicative update or additive update for example um, if delta is larger than epsilon um, scale delta back to satisfy the constraint. So this sounds like a good idea, but um, you have to still specify what you mean by scaling. Uh, does that mean uh, alpha normalization or um, yeah, alpha normalization to something smaller than the um, epsilon ball or exactly to epsilon and so on? So this is still not so clear, so it has to be specified. And then eventually you return the perturbed image. So that sounds good. Um, but here, uh, because you have not specified um, these details, I'm going to deduct a few points for that. Okay. All right. Um, more explainability. Um, explain soundness for a feature attribution method. Give two examples of soundness evaluation methods. Explain their evaluation procedures. Um, and then say, um, so the first part is more like a basic question type of um, question. 
And the second part is more like application to an actual paper. So I'm going to give you an expert excerpt of a paper, smooth bread, removing noise by adding noise. Um, and then you have, to, you have to explain how the paper fails to provide a quantifiable comparison of the, of the soundness of smooth bread against prior methods. Okay, so in the paper, you're going to see that the paper tries to make an argument around, yeah, we are um, generating better um, yeah, visualization than the previous methods. Um, but you have to say that that's not sufficient. Yeah. Um, so if you look at, for example, here, um, you're going to see that yeah, we're doing a better than vanilla gradient or integrated gradient because you're showing you something that's cleaner and delineates the object um, more precisely. Well, you have to uh, um, remind the, the reader of the definition of soundness and how the visualization here does not meet the criteria for soundness. And this could potentially mislead the readers into thinking um, yeah, a good visualization is what, what is needed for a good explanation. Yeah, you know, like this could have been the actual representation of what the model is doing, right? And this is a very fake representation as well. Uh, in that case, uh, we could say, um, yeah, human intuition is this, but models are not following human intuition. Okay. Um, Yeah, so it's giving you uh, good yeah, examples of soundness evaluation. Um, but I, I have deducted a few points for not detailing the how bit, um, the sensitivity analysis uh, here. So let's read that. So this method tests how um, changes in input affects the model's output. In practice, it involves slightly modifying an input feature and observing the change in the model's output. A sound attribution method should show a significant change in attribution for features that strongly influence the output. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, hand wavy and um, um, not as specific as possible um, as we have dealt with in the lecture. In the lecture, we also talked about different ways of um, measuring this quantifiably. So based on this description, uh, we are not able to build any code base for uh, measuring the um, sensitivity, for example. So um, this is not sufficient, and I want something that's more quantifiable. Does that, does that sound right? Um, and then uh, there's ground truth comparison as well, and uh, here um, it talks about broadly about, yeah, um, you can, you can use samples where the ground truth feature is known um, and compare the ground truth feature against the, um, the predicted feature. Uh, but again, that's not sufficient because, um, you know, um, you have to tell us um, where, like, what is a possible strategy to generate such a sample with a known feature, known ground truth feature attribution, okay? I think this is done better in the, in the previous uh, basic question, um, answer for the basic question. Um, so yeah, that's why um, some points are deducted in this case. Um, yeah, for this paper, uh, for reading the excerpt from the paper, um, I'm also deducting a few points because um, it makes the right Location claim, like um, it does not provide major benchmarks, for example. Um, so without numerical or statistical comparison, it's hard to declare this is doing a better job. Um, but, um, but here the issue is that you're not referring to the exact part of the excerpt. Like if you look at, uh, for example, the figure here, um, you see a problem, right? Or if you look at the text um, within the paper, it makes a false claim, for example. So we need more specific reference to, to the part of the, um, the text or table or figure. So for this type of question, that's kind of the level we are looking for in the answer. 
By the way, there, there will be um, these kind of um, paper-based questions in the exam. So there was one last year as well. And the difference is that last year we gave the full paper for the question uh, to make it suitable for a 30-minute question. But this year we're going to um, um, make an excerpt of the paper uh, to make it quicker to read it and um, refer to the right section, basically, if there is one. And finally, there is uh, this question from uncertainty side um, where you have to do a gradient computation for the mixture of Laplacian. So in the lecture, we talked about mixture of Gaussian, um, but this is now a mixture of Laplacian distribution. And you have to basically follow the same kind of um, computation as we did in the lecture um, and eventually show that um, the individual loss gradient for each expert follows the uh, softmax weighted um, gradient for the individual loss. Okay. So this is just an exercise extension, um, but <clears throat> since this is a kind of long computation, uh, we made this uh, more advanced version. Right, final topics. Um, I value benchmarking and evaluation quite a bit in uh, machine learning. And in the past, I have worked a lot on kind of cleaning up the field community by saying, yeah, look, uh, what you have been doing so far is um, chaotic, all messed up. So I'm here to clean things up and say, well, actually, all the complex stuff that you have been doing is actually worse than the simplest possible solution here. If you do the right parameter tuning, hyperparameter tuning, and if you make all sensible choices. And, um, and that's kind of uh, rewinding all the developments in the field like five years back. And then we have to start with the five years ago stuff again um, to build something meaningful. Uh, so apparently that's sort of uh, moving things back. Uh, but at the same time, it's not me who's doing that. It's the field who has been building on top of something that's uh, not solid. Um, so that's the importance of benchmark. If you're working with a benchmark that's flawed, then um, there will be tons of people, hundreds of people um, trying to solve the, the problem in a wrong way. And then you're wasting those hundreds of people times uh, how many years, right? Uh, men time, and that's, uh, that's way too much waste. Um, so we have to set up the benchmark event and evaluation correctly in the first place. Um, this, these are based stuff. Uh, why do you do evaluation? Because you want to rank something. Why does ranking matter? Because not because you want to say I'm the SOTA uh, state of the art, but you want to say we're doing better than random chance, for example, right? Uh, which could be a hard baseline to beat sometimes. Um, and sometimes you want to say, yeah, we are actually doing better than humans. And for that, we need some quantifiable metric. This is what I said. Uh, so in uh, metric learning, so there is a paper called Metric Learning Reality Check. Um, contrastive learning is the basic way to do it. You just have pair of samples and you're given labels saying these are identical, uh, semantically same or dissimilar, and you train with those, um, those signals. But uh, on top of that, there have been so many different ways of training such a metric space. Um, sometimes you have triplets, sometimes you have quadruplets, or n tuples, or all kinds of yeah, uh, learning signals and optimization algorithms. Uh, what this paper is saying is, yeah, these are apparent improvement, improvement um, in performances over the years from 20, um, 2006 to 2020, but um, if you do the evaluation right, then actually um, your initial basic model, contrastive learning, is not doing worse than the, um, the methods afterwards. Okay. Um, then uh, we have to question uh, what have we done in the last 15 years, right? And this also gives a very strong um, kind of message to the practitioners. They don't need to really look into such a complicated um, methods after contrastive learning. They can just use contrastive learning and 
um, get the most of it. And that's what I said. Um, the same goes, um, the same is true for many other um, yeah, areas of research, space detection, social learning, and so on and so forth. So this is like a common pattern um, you see in uh, machine learning. Recently with the large language models, uh, right, um, how to evaluate and benchmark language models is also um, a big issue basically. So um, now what are the recipes for wrong benchmarking, okay? <clears throat> so the first way to do it wrong is everyone is writing their own evaluation metric, okay? Um, when you write evaluation metric, there are some non-trivial bits. For example, when you um, write your code for precision computation, uh, when the threshold is super high, then um, you encounter the quantities like zero divided by zero, because the true positive zero for super high threshold, but also the number of positive prediction is also zero for that. So how do you exactly define this quantity could make a small difference in the, in the um, evaluation afterwards. Um, so the rule of thumb here is to just use what others have used in the, in the code. If the other, um, <clears throat> if the existing evaluation benchmark, evaluation metric code is using PyTorch or Python, um, then use that. And make sure to um, unit test it to make sure um, it's doing the right job. And also um, you wanna make sure that the library, underlying library hasn't gone through um, a lot of changes in the meantime. Otherwise, uh, the library changes could also uh, make things a little bit different, like in terms of handling the, um, <clears throat> the corner cases like this one. So, okay. And also, um, you can also confound multiple factors when comparing methods. So these are, again, um, metric learning um, papers. If you look at the results, it's kind of improving over time. But um, one of the main points that this paper, the metric learning reality check um, came up with was that uh, over time, it's not just the loss functions, but also the architecture that changed, right? And people actually don't talk too much about the architecture, underlying architecture. But uh, most of the improvements in performance is often attributed to architecture itself. Right. ResNet is obviously much better than the, the rest of the um, yeah, architectures here. Um, and some people also hide extra resources needed to make improvements. So if you're just comparing methods in terms of total accuracy, then this rare method is doing a good job here. But um, if you also consider the efficiency, right? How much time it takes, then it turns out uh, there's no good trade-off for the small gap that you need. Um, and the, the, the cost you have to pay is super large here. And um, yeah, this is um, a big problem with the language model evaluation these days. Um, the evaluation benchmark has been used in the training of the uh, large language models. So, um, you can surely overfit to the, to the test benchmarks super well. There, there's Hugging Face uh, leaderboard on um, public models and um, language models, right? And um, there people compete against each other, like the companies compete against each other and for their publicity and branding, it's very important for them to have a high rank in the, in the benchmark. What they can easily do um, if the evaluation benchmark is based on public data sets, is you simply feed in those data sets to training these models. And of course, you're gonna have much better performances, okay? Yeah, this is sort of a BERT 
era kind of problem, right? But now we have even more serious problem with the Lynch models. I mean, uh, large Lynch models. Bertie is also a Lynch model. Um, some people um, make a mistake here by not using a validation set. You know, um, Cypher and ImageNet, these are very popular ImageNet image classification benchmarks, but they don't actually come with validation sets. So what people do is they make all design choices over the test set and report the final numbers on the test set. So um, there is quite a bit of um, overfitting to test set, of course. And so to avoid that, people came up with a concept like um, ImageNet validation version two or something, right? So um, this is original version one validation accuracy, and this is like version two validation accuracy where people collected the same copy of, um, a similar copy of the validation set by following the same procedure for data collection. Um, <clears throat> so this is more like a test, um, test set now. Um, and this dash line is x equals y line. So ideally, all the points should lie on this line if, the, if there's no overfitting to the um, particular validation set so far. Um, but if you look at the current methods, they all seem to lie on the uh, on a line which is different from the x equals y. So there's, uh, there are better scores for the validation set compared to uh, the new set. So there is some evidence for overfitting here, both for Cypher and ImageNet. Okay, so that was it for benchmarking. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work around benchmarking and evaluation to make sure um, it's like a meta study, um, but I think that's very important. Um, it's affecting a lot of people in the, um, in the research community and it's really directing the focus in the right direction for the whole community. Uh, let's talk about the research at um, State Group, Scalable Trust for the AI. I'll start by what I mean by scalability. <clears throat> Because you know what trustworthy is, for example. What do I mean by scalability here? Um, trustworthy machine learning is often studied with toy data sets. So if you look at OD generalization, these are all you know, um, MNIST or smaller resolution types of images. So um, the dimension is small, the number of samples is super, super small. Um, and uh, in, terms of, in terms of supervision and uh, analysis, you'll have more precise and extensive labels available. So um, quick evaluation is possible and you can also do quite a bit of controlled experiments. So you're gonna understand um, how the model is working and it's working because of what, for example, you can do all kinds of analysis here. And also uh, within this kind of realm of computation, people can come up with very complicated methods, which involves um, a lot of modeling and a lot of hyperparameters. Um, right, but now uh, when you move on to larger scale data sets like high dimensional data, large number of training samples, <clears throat> and um, there's much less uh, high quality labels, then um, you know validation of an idea in this scale could take um, days or even weeks. Um, so it's really hard to analyze what are the contributing factors for the performance or give an idea for how to improve um, further, right? Um, and because of that, we typically need simpler methods with very few number of hyperparameters. So um, here the question is, uh, our question is how to move beyond the toyish data to more um, complex data, right? So one strategy is uh, to um, work first with toyish data and um, there we can be fully creative and we can propose whatever idea um, that works and we can make quick experiments around that. And there, important thing is to understand why things work. Okay. Instead of just saying, um, yeah, in this Toysh data set, it's working, that's not sufficient. You have to say, 
it's working because of this and that. Because um, only based on that can you extend to more realistic cases, because now you know what are the important factors, and you basically focus on that factor and uh, kind of get rid of all the other irrelevant factors. In other words, you're trying to make things simpler. And then being simple, you're now ready to uh, move to um, larger scale cases. Yes. Um, so this is another story of um, simple wins, right? In fact, um, in many cases, when you come with a complicated method, um, it's not worth it, um, so many cases. So this is a paper called In Search of Lost Domain Generalization. And this paper says ERM is the simplest initial method for doing um, data domain generalization. And there's been tons of um, follow-up methods, okay, claiming that it's doing a better job than the preceding ones. Um, but if you do a uh, sanity check on whether they are doing a right, it turns out um, ERM on average is not doing worse than the other uh, follow-up methods. So simply is good. Um, ah, this is another, um, another field actually, image classification. So that was uh, domain generalization. Now this is more general um, image classification. And uh, there has been a lot of other methods on top of cross entropy classification um, in the last few years. And it turns out cross entropy classification is doing the best, not the best job, but not the worst job. <laughs> um, it's not worse than the others. So, ah yeah, and this is uh, one of my papers from, uh, from the past. And we also said um, there was CAM, class activation mapping, and then some follow-up methods. But it turns out um, CAM is not worse than the, the more complicated methods. So you're, I think uh, based on the observations that we have, um, I feel like um, this is a common pattern in many uh, machine learning fields, maybe even beyond machine learning. Um, and what probably, the focus that we have to pursue is perhaps a really a simple solution that works in practice rather than um, beating the state of the art in the benchmark uh, for the sake of practicality. Okay, so that's it for the scalability bit. So scalability um, is closely linked to simpleness, simplicity. So that's one of the principles that I follow. Research topics at um, the group. Um, so I'm pursuing more data-centric tools for the AI. And that's uh, one of the strategies to achieve scalability for trustworthiness, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so I said at the beginning of the lecture that uh, we are interested in more how question than what question with the uh, machine learning nowadays. We're not just caring about whether the model is doing the job, but um, we care about how the model is doing the job, okay? And that means, um, instead of just why here, we also care about the intermediate path here, Z, okay? Uh, machine learning 1.0, um, I would say, is more about the distribution, the, um, the relationship between X and Y, but now we care also about X, Y, and Z, the intermediate steps. The problem is uh, people have been yeah, using this XY type of data for approaching uh, the what problem, but uh, we're still using the same kind of ingredient for, um, for doing the, uh, this new task. I'm trying to say uh, this is not sufficient. We need some new types of data. Um, so this is the set status quo of machine learning community. We are using, primarily using XY data, which is something. Um, <clears throat> and I think the upper bound of the, um, the how performance is here, if you just use uh, this type of data. Um, I would say this is more a benchmarking approach. Um, you set up a benchmark and say, yeah, um, we use, uh, you can use so-and-so data and um, 
if you go beyond that, you have to declare, yeah, we are using more resources. And um, of course, uh, we are, because we are using more resources, we have to get, we have to do a much better job here, right? So you have to be clear about what kind of data you're using and um, you're comparing methods based on the, um, among the methods that use the same amount of resources, okay? And uh, so because of that, primarily the focus is kind of given this, this uh, limited resource, how much can we get out of that? And that's good. I mean, that has led the, uh, the revolution, like AI revolution on ImageNet and nowadays uh, language models. That's good. But now um, that's very limited and uh, there's much more possibility, I would say, when we do not uh, be super restrictive about what kind of resources can we use. And I call this uh, data hunting approach. Um, the goal here is to solve the problem at all, right? The how problem is super hard. So um, being able to solve it at all is, um, is already something. And the question here is not um, really about given the resource, how much can you get out of that? It's more about Given the problem, what are the resources that's going to get me there, right? And this is like a dual problem, right? And um, it's kind of um, making this possible at all, basically. And I feel like uh, this is a future, definite future for addressing the how task in the future. And here the, the focus should be more about where to source the data and how to get this from humans, for example, or from the web, for example. Already this shift is happening with the um, instruction tuning, um, which is kind of extracting uh, supervision from humans to instruct the uh, language models further to align better with human intentions. Um, so this is kind of happening in the language domain. I wish this to happen more in practice and in many other areas of machine learning. And so uh, we wish to kind of combine the ideas from data-centric AI and uh, trustworthy AI together to get uh, more data that's suitable for achieving um, the goals in trustworthy AI. Um, I like to show this kind of figure for um, my vision of how data should look like in the future. So for building a machine learning model, there are two pathways of knowledge from, from humans, I would say. Well, model is eventually uh, built by humans, right? It's kind of a replication of human knowledge. And there are two pathways. So one is through training and the other one is through validation. Um, during training, the model sees data from annotators or from the web or Right, whatever uh, data um, processing um, pipeline, right? And there um, you get knowledge of, um, the knowledge from the annotators are um, distilled into the data set. It's more crowdsourced, but rather simplistic kind of knowledge. Uh, but there's um, the second source of um, knowledge from humans, which is often forgotten from the uh, machine learning engineer by doing all kinds of validation and um, experiments around the model. Um, um, the model gets to know what is an imp important objective that it has to achieve. For example, if it has to achieve good OD generalization, right? Then what this engineer will do is to um, build a OD-like validation set and see if the model is doing a right job in this validation set. And that's all part of this uh, validation knowledge. <clears throat> and so far, uh, we have trained the model for the what part of supervision using annotators. And the how part is done by the engineer. And I'm trying to say that um, in the future, we have to also extract the how information from crowdsourcing, for example. So try to look for sources of such knowledge. Um, yeah, um, and now 
we call this data-centric trustworthiness and specific areas of uh, research could be, for example, using free or cheap data to improve model robustness. We can also look into data-centric XA, like attributing to specific um, samples in the training set. Um, and I'm also interested in um, training new representations for characterizing data. There are some applications like medicine, finance, economics, um, yeah, that I'm personally interested in. Um, yeah, this is one minute video, but I'm probably going to skip it. If you're interested, you can go into this video and see how one could um, acquire, well, I'm going to skip over it uh, very quickly. Making them better at the Imagine Oops. training AI. No? Okay. Doesn't work this way. I'm just going to show, yeah, in ImageNet uh, annotations, what people do is they select an image, like, uh, like by moving mouse pointer. Um, typically, you're just collecting whether each image is clicked on or not, but uh, we are also collecting the click locations now. And the click location, for example, tends to contain the object location. And if you're training an image classifier with the object location information as well as kind of a secondary information, then it improves the uh, OD generalization of the model. And it kind of knows, um, it's kind of uh, regularizing the internal kind of mechanism of a model. And uh, this kind of information is actually given for free in um, typical annotation procedure. And because this is free, um, why not use that, right? That's the message here. So the data set is here and here. So examples are, example byproducts from the annotation is, uh, for example, click locations or mouse trajectory, which, which could give you information about object location. It's gonna be very noisy, but still better than no information at all. Um, there are interesting um, types of information like how much time it took for the annotator to click, right? Or the uh, correction history. If the annotator is not sure, then um, they're gonna make uh, corrections several times. If that happens, then um, that's a good indication that this sample is hard. And this hardness information could uh, further train the model to, um, with the awareness of which samples are difficult. And this, for example, enables curriculum learning for the, for the models, um, or could be a source uh, for supervision of uncertainty estimation for the model. Um, there can be um, further information about who has annotated this image and which images are annotated by the same annotator. That could give you information about uh, what is potential bias in the annotators. If the annotator um, is left-handed or right-handed, depending on that, maybe the trajectory information will be different. And uh, by using the uh, annotation, uh, annotator information, you may be able to normalize that out. Um, or maybe some of the annotators do not know a certain class in the ImageNet 1000 classes and um, does a very poor job for that class. Then we can probably reduce the uh, confidence value for those classes. Uh, we have only tested the first one. Um, these two other factors are future work, basically. Um, for data-centric XAI, um, there, um, we have Elisa and Evgeny working on the, um, the uh, analysis of um, yeah, black box neural networks. We are currently assessing whether the existing um, data-centric XAI is uh, serving the uh, practitioners sufficiently well. And we are also working on um, possibly um, redefining the task for data-centric XAI. If you remember what, uh, what influence function is doing, it's basically um, trying to approximate the change in loss value for a certain test sample when you change, when you exclude certain um, training sample. So you leave out one training sample and see what's the impact on one test sample. But we believe uh, that's potentially a way to, um, no one cares really, right? Um, so here the question is what happens, would the practitioners be happier 
if we give a tool for um, for quickly checking what's going to happen to the model if you remove a group of samples rather than a single sample, a group of samples, and its impact on not just a single test sample but on a group of test samples. So this kind of a uh, task defining is what we are working on at the moment. Um, I'm generally excited about time series data and future prediction. <laughs> um, this is very relevant for many occupations. If you're a doctor, um, how you make a, make a prediction for a prognosis of a patient is based on um, their prior experience. If they, have, if they have seen a lot of patients in the past, then they know uh, what's going to happen to this current patient. Uh, based on the current lab values of the patient and so on. And all of this is done by some form of retrieval from the past training samples. Um, what machine learning could help humans in a trustworthy way in such cases is not um, making a decision for the doctors or decision makers by them, um, like in place of them, but helping them with the retrieval itself, right? So what I'm interested in is uh, for these applications, uh, finance, economics, history, climate change, and uh, medical applications, um, it's just making just predictions. I'm interested in um, pulling out relevant past, past examples. On top of that, I'm also interested in um, representations beyond metric spaces. You know, um, one quick way to say what metric space is doing is their data points and you have pairwise similarity among the data points. It sounds like a very general definition of a space. And in fact, it is. Um, it includes a Euclidean space, for example, or manifolds, which is more curved Euclidean space. Um, also topological space, you know, Topological space, if you know what this is, uh, this is a more general notion of um, metric space. Um, but topological space is still very limited because it still encodes what is similar and what is not similar. What I'm saying is we have to go beyond all of that. We don't care just about similarity of data points, but we are also interested in the inclusion relationship. If you think about it, inclusion relationship is not encoded by similarity. Um, why do we care about inclusion relationship? Because oftentimes we have to represent variable length text, for example, or variable length images. Some images has more resolution and contains more information, some of them less. Um, if we wish to represent all of these cases in the same space, then there has to be a way to kind of encode different amount of information per data sample. And one natural way to do that is to um, uh, change the nature of space into not just encoding similarity, but also inclusion. And uh, one possible way to do that is using probability embeddings. Okay? Uh, with sets, we have the notion of inclusion, right? So instead of just predicting a point, I'm interested in predicting a set. And one uh, nice differential way to represent a set is to represent a distribution. So these are examples when the, um, the description is super long um, and there is a case when the description is quite short. Um, it doesn't make sense to um, embed both of them into 1024 dimensional space. Maybe um, you wish to assign different variants, for example, to indicate which one is including the other. The same goes for images, right? There are different levels of complexity depending on um, the clutterness. Yeah. Uh, finally, I'm also interested in uh, explaining compositionality in generative AI. So let's say there's an output image like this one. Um, in data-centric XAI, you're interested in pulling out the training samples that are contributing to the current generation, for example. Um, but you know, um, 
It's not as simple as that for current generative models. It's basically making a composition of existing training samples, maybe patchwise or maybe at a more conceptual level, um, to make an output image. Here the question is, uh, what are the contributing samples that gives um, some component of it to the current generation, instead of just a verbatim copy of the training samples? So um, this is another task which is still uh, to be defined further, um, but it has a lot of practical value in, um, in the future. So this is one of the topics that uh, I'm interested in. Um, finally, uh, I wish to tell you um, what each member of our group is working on. <clears throat> Michael is working on uh, uncertainty estimation. Um, he's the one who has worked on probabilistic embeddings. And there um, he has shown that, you know, for probabilistic embeddings is the latent variable model. So <clears throat> in principle, there is no such concept as a proper scoring rule. There is no guarantee that the true latent will be recovered in general. But he has found one condition um, and one loss function, which is guaranteed to retrieve, recover this, um, the true latent um, variable in the limit of infinite data. <clears throat> and there's a pre-trained uncertainty um, that he's been working on that is uh, basically scaling up the um, probability embeddings to image net scale and use that as kind of a pre-trained model for downstream uncertainty estimation. We have one paper at NeurIPS and the other one soon to be published. Elisa is working on uh, basically data-centric XAI and from a more human-centric, human-centered point of view. Um, we are re re redefining the task of data-centric XAI, as I just said, right? Um, instead of single samples, we are interested in removing multiple samples and the impact on multiple samples, test samples. Um, and we go to humans to check if that's something that's gonna make them happy. Uh, with Balint here, um, we are working on uncertainty de decomposition. Um, when these methods are proposed, we typically come with um, a name tag, basically, um, whether this method is measuring predictive uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty or aleatorial uncertainty, okay? But um, as far as we know, uh, no one has questioned whether these, they are actually doing what they are supposed to do. Maybe, um, the method is declared to do aleatorial uncertainty, but maybe this is super good for epistemic uncertainty. I mean, theoretically, um, DMA is trying to measure epistemic uncertainty, but who knows, it, it's probably very good at measuring aleatorial uncertainty, right? So we are cross-checking all these uh, possible combinations, whether um, uh, something is done better by the other methods and so on. And the answer here is that in many cases, um, Uncertainty estimate claim to be good at epistemic. They, these are good at electric uncertainty and vice versa. So the results are all mixed up. Quite interesting and soon to be published. Arnas is working on um, compositional generalization. Uh, compositional generalization is a kind of a generalization where you have seen every factor at least once, but the combination of the factors itself is something new at test time, okay? Um, he's questioning when and how this compositional generalization is happening, okay? Under which kind of conditions, right? Um, does it mean you have to see a lot of um, diverse compositions um, you have to see in order to be able to generalize to unseen cases, right? So that is also soon to be published and he has one capacity for master thesis from summer this year, okay? Um, Ankit is, uh, is another uh, PhD student, um, new PhD student in our group. Um, he's understanding the solution space. You know the uh, mode connectivity paper from uh, one of the lectures, right? Um, which is saying two solutions are almost always connected to a third point, to a simple curve. Um, the research question is here is whether we can um, make a stronger statement, okay? So the kind of uh, statement that we're gonna make is, yeah, the third point, which connects two solutions, 
the third point is some is uh, is actually shared by all arbitrary pairs of solutions in the solution space. So in other words, um, let's say there are n different solutions, and we can find one very special solution, which is connecting all these n solutions together through a simple curve, simple linear segment. Um, such a space is called star domain. The star domain is a space where you, you can find a single element in the set, which is line linearly connected to all the other points in the space. So our claim is that the solution space is a star domain. And this is soon to be publish published as well. Uh, finally, Alex is working on diverse ensembles for OD generalization. Um, it's a, yeah, diverse ensemble is a conceptually sound solution for OD generalization and adapting to possibly different diverse environments in the FPS time. Um, current issue is that if you look at the papers, right, they are not scalable. They're only tested on toy data sets. Here the question is whether you can extend um, the methods to more um, yeah, um, scalable. Can you scale this up to ImageNet plus scale, basically? And uh, the results will be will soon to be published as well. And uh, he also has one uh, capacity for massive thesis from summer. Okay, so this is the final slide. Thank everyone for attending the lecture this year. And uh, I wish you good luck for the exams as well if you have registered. Thank you. <laughs>